welcome to the third talk of the week, um, Geography Awareness Week. We had a couple of talks this week already on uh, the geography of Japan and uh, climbing mountains in Ontario. And today we go from kind of a cultural geography side to a more physical geography side, and we have our very own Ted Keller um, who's going to talk about the geography of storms in the USA. Um, I also would like to say that um, we're not done with the week. We have two more talks. Uh, tomorrow and Friday. Tomorrow, for those of you who are probably more interested in uh, cities and city planning, we have a local architect talking about uh, uh, downtown revitalization in the uh, square here in Springfield. And then on Friday, we have Linnea and Andrea, who's a faculty member in the department, talking about geoparks in Portugal. Um, but, uh, today, I don't want to see the uh, limelight from uh, Ted, so I want to introduce him, even though you probably know who he is by now, that um, Ted has been the senior meteorologist here at uh, Color 10, um, one of the local TV stations, for 25 years. Um, he has also um, taught uh, different aspects of um, weather, climate, um, and about storms here at Missouri State in the Department of um, Local Geology and Planning for a number of years, probably about the same time. Um, he is very passionate about storm chasing, which is what he's going to be talking about today. Um, and he has done this personally and professionally for about eight years. Um, he was involved in the first ever storm chase class taught at the university in 2009, and again this past year. So um, I let Ted talk about um, the rest of you know, about soul chasing. So, okay. oh, one, one thing before I forget, um, sign up sheets for those of you who need extra credit or whatever, I have two for two classes. I have um, for Dr. Paul Rollinson and I have one for um, Mr. Adam Coulter. Um, you can sign up here and I'm not sure what other arrangements you have with your other classes, but uh, signatures or anything like that, we'll take care of that after the presentation. Thank you. And also in a side deal, if you wash my car, a car or if you sit my kids, I'll double your points. <laughs> Most people don't realize that's a little clause that was built in. Um, how you guys doing? Here for the points. Here for the points. Uh, no, some of you are sure that's fine. You know, it's part of the academic life, right? A um, couple of things I want to add to the storm chasing thing. You know, um, I sat uh, at the desk at the uh, Color Tech behind the scenes and covered lots of tornado warnings over the years uh, in an office which to this day still doesn't have a window, which I think is rather curious. And uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but in the year 2003, we had a tornado outbreak in southwest Missouri. How many are natives of this area? Do you remember that outbreak, the one I'm talking about? I always remember it as 543. <clears throat> so it was May 4, 2003. That's the storm that came through Pure City, went north of Marionville, and then tore up Battlefield, while almost simultaneously a second tornado tore up Stockton, went across Norman Polk, and uh, also went into Camden County, and uh, it killed some people there. That doesn't get a lot of press because it did hit a major town, uh, but uh, that storm was impressive as well. And I guess it was that year. And a combination of that and maybe technology or maybe me just thinking, you know what, maybe it's just time. I don't know. But the year after that is when I personally chose to go storm chasing for the first time. Which is interesting because the, the point of my talk today is that this is actually a relatively easy thing to do in the United States. And it's right there. It's not that far away from where we live here in southwest Missouri. Just a little bit of a drive increases your chance of seeing a tornado, uh, let's say for your lifetime, by quite, quite a number of factors. Um, you can basically live in Oklahoma City at the right old age of 70 and have a really good chance of a tornado coming within about oh, four miles of you. That's pretty amazing. There's no place else on the planet where that's true. So anyway, uh, yeah, storm chasing started out uh, that way. And it was a private thing for me at first. I just took my car and took whatever I had. But back then, there were cell phones but not nearly to the advanced level of the smartphone now. Um, you know, you got onboard radar and computers and all that now. Then you could have gotten that. I didn't own any of that. I just went out and just looked at the sky, basically, and figured it out. Actually, 
didn't do all that badly as it turned out. And I was hooked, but hooked in, a, in, a, in, a, in the same way that if you've never gambled before and you put a quarter in a slot machine and you win $100, and you think that's going to happen every single time after that? Well, uh, storm chasing is a lot of sitting on your butt and driving and driving and sometimes driving late at night and falling asleep and then saying, oh, well, i got to stop, i got to sleep. Uh, for maybe about an hour, maybe two hours of pure adrenaline excitement and then maybe about 16 hours of, of driving and driving. In fact, we'll leave the driving out and just show you the good parts. Okay. Uh, so anyway, since it's Jockey Awareness Week, uh, you know, I want to explain why it is that geography plays a role in making this the tornado capital of the world. And uh, we'll start here today with sobering video. And every single year, over the last couple of years, the tornado frequency uh, and intensity and terror and insidiousness of the tornado seem to be going up. It's almost like the storms are on steroids in a way. And uh, so I'll show you here um, the beginning footage of the Joplin tornado in Joplin storm chasers. And I was out that day, by the way. I was 15 minutes west of where this was, where most chasers were on a storm that never produced. And by the time we figured out we should be heading east, it was too late. And I actually think of that as a good thing because I don't really, didn't really have any desire to be anywhere near this thing. But here it is. Yeah, I can smell it too. Good gosh. That is freaking ridiculous damage. All right, 
very, very sobering. And there really isn't any other place on the planet that produces tornadoes of this intensity. And this isn't just a fluke event. These happen, EF5s, probably on average about one every four or five years somewhere in the United States. This one just happened to hit, uh, unfortunately, in the center of a very highly populated area on a weekend. It took out a third of the city. And um, it had warning. That was the good news. But, you know, the warning issue is very interesting. You know, when you say it had warning, the, the people had tornado warnings, okay? You all had tornado warnings, right? But did you, when you heard those tornado warnings, did you think, oh, I'm probably not going to see one, or if I do, it's probably going to take off the roof over there or something. But nobody ever imagines in their wildest dreams that a third of their city is about to disappear. So one of the things that's being rustled around with right now in the Weather Service who issues the warning is, is there any way to add more information to this, to, to try to differentiate between tornado warnings and tornado warnings. Very slippery slope, hard to come up with. This video is completely different and speaks volumes, even though the folks in it, the guy that's shooting it doesn't speak at all. So it comes back basically in the fall and in the winter and the springtime. 
geometry winds go back and forth, north and south. Warm and humid air means that instability uh, is more prevalent in the middle latitudes as well. The northern hemisphere sees more twisters because there is more land mass. Uh, you basically have a, a greater conversion of, set, of, of, of insulation or solar energy into sensible heat at the ground. In other words, the ground just gets hot, there's more ground there, and that leads to more instability. The air can become more unstable when heated from below. Also, uh, a land adds friction to wind flow, and friction actually helps to develop winds near the ground more favorable for tornado development. We assume, we can't prove, but we assume that uh, even though you see high frequencies of tornadoes in North America and in Europe, that that frequency did not spread over the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, nobody there to see it, but we're pretty sure it doesn't work that way, mostly because of the frictional effects and because the oceans don't respond to the solar energy of the sun nearly as fast. That's an impressive map. Welcome to the tornado capital of the world. That stops in 2003 and only goes back to 1950. 1950 was a year that was considered to be a year where the Weather Service finally started keeping records of any worth, meaning the intensity is recorded, the latitude and longitude start and end point, the number of people killed and injured, the damage, uh, all these things were finally accurately logged. <clears throat> if you look closely, there's little red streaks there in Nevada and out there in Idaho. So every state has had one. Um, pretty impressive. And there's a little map down there, and it's set there on the bottom left hand corner, which kind of uh, makes the same point as the map previous to that about where some of these hot spots are elsewhere on the planet. But we, hands down, own the frequency. Tornadoes per 10,000 square miles look something like this. So if you live in central Oklahoma, nine tornadoes within 10,000 square miles every year. That is pretty high. Uh, your probability of being affected by one is 100%. Affected meaning you know someone who is uh, hurt or killed or, or had their house damaged or something like that. That's a given if you live in Oklahoma. Um, it's interesting though, these little hot spots move around. Like there's a rather anomalous looking one there over in Indiana. And a lot of times tornado outbreaks uh, really define this map. So it depends on when you calculate it and how many years you go back. Um, you know, uh, you can change this uh, outlook quite a bit. Uh, but one thing that does stay consistent is that the central band that runs from Nebraska, south through Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas never really moves. That is the so-called tornado belt, sometimes referred to as tornado alley. That's an old 1940s and 50s phrase. Um, uh, you know, it's a, just a high frequency area of tornadoes. Yeah, I'm upset about it too. Um, so why do we have so many twisters? What combination of factors come together in the United States uh, here to make it the tornado capital of the world? Uh, to answer this, we have to examine what is necessary for a severe thunderstorm and then bring it to the next level, thunderstorms leading to tornadoes. You should note that, th that thunderstorms are occurring around the planet all the time. Only about 10% of them we calculate in the United States are producing severe weather. And there are three things that make the thunderstorm severe. Tornado, duh, uh, hail, and strong winds. Not tornadic winds. So we've got certain criteria that are laid down for that. If the storm exceeds those, it's considered severe. So uh, all the thunderstorms, we think about 10% are doing that. And the hint is that geography does play a huge role uh, in this uh, maximum of tornadoes that we see. So what do severe thunderstorms like, anyway? What do they need? Flourish. Well, unstable air is one thing. We'll delve into each one of these here one by one. Uh, unstable air. We also need favorable winds at all levels. Explain what that means. We need a supply of water vapor. It does you little good to have unstable air and great winds if you're in the middle of a desert with no water vapor and you can't form a cloud. You can't form a cloud, you can't form thunderstorms, it kind of follows. You might get a dust level, that's another program. Um, and I tell this to my students, and a few of you are here, I just said this either today or yesterday. The single most fascinating thing to me about a thunderstorm, especially a thunderstorm that produces something like a Joplin tornado, is the power and how it's manifest. For instance, we think of power in terms of space shuttles and rockets and big machines and huge boulders and things that can that can lift up beams to build skyscrapers and all these powerful machines and huge ocean liners and all this. A thunderstorm that produces a tornado, the 
the intensity of Joplin is made up of air and water and ice floating in the air. That's all it is. I think that is the most fascinating thing about tornadoes and severe thunderstorms. And the last thing they like is a trigger to force all this into motion. Sometimes the trigger doesn't need to be very uh, strong. If all three of those are in plentiful supply and lined up just right, all you need is a, you know, you hear about the whole air trigger response. It just it doesn't need much more to go on. So what is unstable air? Air is that when it displays upwards, goes up, it wants to keep going up and accelerate away from its point. You've seen this in much more development, perhaps. You've seen cumulus clouds grow every summer day. They go up, and they go up, and they go up, and they were pushed initially, either because they were buoyant, meaning they were lighter than their surroundings, or because something shoved them up like a hill or something. Uh, we don't know necessarily. But if it keeps going up, the air is unstable. And that's a very important thing to have. If you don't have that, you're not really going to ever get thunderstorms of any significance. How can you make air unstable? Warm it on the bottom, cool it on the top. And the way our planet works, you can cool the top in certain circumstances, but because our atmosphere is heated from the bottom up, it is much easier to warm the bottom. Every single time the sun comes up every day, you're warming the bottom because the sun comes up, heats the ground, and heats the air in contact with the ground, and there you go. So the easiest way to make air stable is to have a day unfold. Right about now, if the sun were out, we'd probably be in our warmest temperature, give or take an hour or so, and we'd be making the air the most unstable it could be because of that effect. So warming the bottom is what we call a diurnal process. The sun comes out and there are no clouds. This heating cycle generally makes air unstable every late afternoon to its maximum intensity. And you can cool the top by other means as well. Another way you can make air unstable is to add water vapor. So if it's more humid, it's probably more unstable. All things also be equal. Also be equal. You can mix up the air, uh, send air up and down. It makes it much, much more unstable. And you can also lift the layer of air split that up. And there are processes in the atmosphere that do that all the time. So let's talk about the favorable winds. Winds with in, which increase in speed with increasing height. Actually, that's a fairly common uh, thing to observe in our atmosphere. The winds at the surface are generally not as strong as the winds are at the jet stream level. And it's a relative thing, too. The winds are 20 miles per hour here. It's 20 windy for us. How fast can they be at the jet stream level? Faster, right? Well, no, gesture winds can easily top 100 miles per hour in the winter, 150 in some areas, approach 200 in some parts of the world. So there can be a rather substantial difference in wind speed. Then winds which turn clockwise with increasing height, meaning they start out of the southeast, as uh, the diagram on the bottom right shows, and by the time they get up higher, they're out of the west. So they have turned, like my hand is turning. That's a clockwise turning with height. That produces uh, a kind of helical flow in the atmosphere that thunderstorms can feed upon tornadoes and do so even more, a torquing or a twisting that these things need to get going. Winds which converge near the ground and diverge a lot. So air is coming together at the surface and being blown out of the top. This helps to create rising motion, forces air up, um, causes low pressure areas to deepen because if you can move the air on the top faster than it's coming in, you can get the pressure to lower. The lower the pressure is, the faster the winds blow, and the whole thing can cascade upon itself. And your strongest nor'easters and thunderstorms and, and uh, large low pressure areas, cyclones are all designed that way. What about the water vapor supply? Increasing the amount of water vapor, all else remaining equal, will increase the amount of energy delivered to a thunderstorm as it's growing. That's because when you change from vapor to liquid, which is what condensation is, it makes the cloud visible, you are releasing something called latent heat. Where did it come from? Why is it latent? Because it was used when the water initially evaporated from wherever it evaporated. It could have evaporated thousands of miles from where it's liberated. And that's it. travel. So it's kind of interesting. You can have a method of heat transfer that's invisible. When vapor comes from the Central Pacific into the United States, travel thousands and thousands and thousands of miles, and it's liberated and condensed into a cloud, at least that heat, you just transfer central Pacific energy right to the center of the United States. It can happen a lot. Water vapors also measure something with something we call the dew point. And uh, I'll show you dew points here in a second, how they change in North America from one season to the next. Pretty amazing. Triggers, something that starts the air moving upwards. So it's unstable, you got a lot of humidity, 
You got favorable winds, you watch, you watch, you watch, nothing happens. That's because there are some things in the atmosphere that despite all three of the other ones there uh, that can actually prevent something from happening unless you give it a show, unless you force the issue somehow, which will be referred to as a trigger. Typical triggers, very commonly, are things that we know about uh, by watching the weather. Uh, cold fronts, warm fronts, these features we see on weather maps all the time, they can certainly have triggers. Low pressure areas, it's another pretty common thing on a, on a weather map. Sometimes though, those low pressure areas can be very subtle, but not the deep blizzard nor'easters that always get the, the attention of the news. The dry line, that's a feature we'll talk quite extensively about here in a minute. Uh, it can help to trigger the storms. Topographic features, the Cat Rock in Texas, is a geographic feature that can that be many chasers swear up and down by and initiate storms on a very local level. Let's come back to this mixing the air idea. Air that rises because it's heating uh, around its heating will expand because there's less air above it and it'll cool. The opposite was true if air is sinking, compensating around the other side, it's being compressed and it warms. So you're basically transferring energy, you're warming the bottom, cooling the top. It's called mixing, and it happens every day. And the only reason I mention it is because there's a part of the United States where this mixing occurs that is absolutely vital to pushing us over the edge as being the real capital of the world. This process of stirring the air up vertically and making it cooler on the top and warmer on the bottom is something that is very, very important to uh, the frequency of tornadoes in the central United States. One thing you should know, uh, springtime just works. The reason that there's an increase in severe thunderstorms in the springtime is simple, several reasons. First of all, the sun, the insulation, the intensity of solar radiation is increasing very, very quickly, from, especially in March. March is the single month that has the greatest amount of solar radiation increase in all months. But it's also increasing quite a bit in April and May as well. Well, the ground is readily receiving this energy and heating up like a firecracker, and it's great, but you know, up in the upper atmosphere, it's still in wintertime sleep mode up there. It's cold. That heat hasn't had a chance to transfer up yet. So what have you just done? You've just uber done this. You've got very hot on the bottom. It's still very cold up here. And you've made an unstable condition simply because you moved from winter to spring and the sun's getting stronger. <clears throat> the temperature contrast, when cold air is brought in proximity to warm air, help to drive strong wind systems. And these wind systems will contribute to some of the things we just talked about. We can increase with height, we can turn a little bit with uh, increasing height, converge and diverge, cause low pressure areas to develop. It's a very dynamic time. Uh, so springtime simply just is a good time to develop severe weather. Warmer temperatures also support a greater supply of water vapor. Why? Because when it's warmer, you are able to evaporate more water. You just have more supply, basically. In wintertime, not so much. And that's great, right, so springtime, you can apply that anywhere on the planet. But what about the United States? What specifically about the USA adds to the number of storms? It kind of takes what we just said and sweetens the pot a little bit. We watch Groundhog Day. At the very beginning when he's doing the weather, Bill Murray, who either did weather or he knew somebody that did weather because he has the sarcasm of being a weathercaster down to a perfect part of science. Oh my gosh, he's and uh, when he's doing the weather at the very beginning, he's, he, he, remember he does that where he blows the cold front? And he goes, well, these big blue things is coming. Very classic. Maybe I'm too much into it because of what I do anyway. But uh, these are air masses. Um, and I circled in yellow the three that are relevant to the United States and North America. Top one is CP, continental polar. Um, CT down to the left there over northern Mexico is continental tropical. MT is maritime tropical. The easy way to remember this is the first one refers to uh, whether it's dry or moist, and the second one refers to whether it's warm or cold. So if it has a polar designation, it's obviously cold. If it has a tropical T, it's warm. If it's C, continental, it's dry. If it's M, maritime, water related, uh, it's going to be probably moist, it is going to be hot. So cold and dry, warm and moist, warm and dry. And notice that those arrows all kind of meet 
there in the central United States. So CP plus MT plus CT equals normals. But here's what I find funny. In almost every article that you may have read on tornado development, it almost seems like the editor of the newspaper or the magazine tells the reporter who probably has very little science background. Please put something in there, in there as to why these horrible storms form, and they will inevitably write down, it's because Boulder clapped into water. Well, that's a very simplistic uh, explanation. It doesn't really go very far, and it certainly is more complicated than that because uh, warm air and cold air are flying every day. They're moving them down in the southeast, and you're not necessarily going to get tornadoes out of that. Uh, so obviously, we have to dig a little deeper. Actually, bringing these air masses together uh, brings the temperature contrasts closer together, and that sets up the wind energy that we talked about earlier. The actual front dividing the cold air from the warmer can actually trigger thunderstorms from those uh, triggers, uh, possibly leading to a tornado. Uh, but it may not be the only player. In many of the worst tornado outbreaks, the cold front had nothing to do with the tornadoes. Joplin was a perfect example of that, no cold front. In fact, cold outflow from storms in Kansas probably had a lot to do with the generation of the storm that eventually produced that tornado. There's a very typical uh, um, layout of the uh, three players, CP, MT, and CT, where they're coming from, a little closer in view and how the fronts and the dry line might set up. So those fronts basically separate all those air masses. Between the cold front and the dry line, you find the CP air. Behind the cold front, you find the CP air. And out ahead of the cold front, but behind the warm front, you find air and top of the And these guys are major players and are around a lot. When we look at the Great Plains, you've got the Gulf of Mexico, you've got the Rocky Mountains, you've got the Colorado Plateau, and you got a Great Plains kind of upwash to general increase and slope across the plains. Those are the geographic features that help to make this the tornado capital of the world, basically. So you got the Rocky Mountains. There they are again. When cold air wants to move south, it wants to spread out longitudinally. It wants to go like this. And the Rockies are like this big barrier to prevent it from doing it and force it to go screaming down the east side of the Rockies, putting it in close proximity to warm air, like that. It kind of forces the issue. So the jet stream, which is mostly fueled at this, at this latitude by those differences in temperature, is flowing with probably some greater intensity because the Rockies are kind of making the cold air come in contact with the warmer all that much faster and with more intensity, more, more temperature change over a short amount of space. It's also another feature of the Rockies when a jet stream that is not curving at all flows over a mountain range, it changes its depth because there's a lid on the atmosphere. So when it gets compressed by the mountains, it, it uh, basically widens and compresses. And this causes rotation to change. And uh, because you have to conserve this rotation, it actually curves upward over the mountains, and then it takes a dip downward when the opposite effect starts happening, when the air, air mass starts to stretch back out again curves back this way. There's a big L right there. It basically means that on the lee side of a rocky mountain range, or any range that you can set up like this, you find a lot of low pressure areas hanging out. And again, we've identified low as an area where uh, it, could, it could be a trigger. It could have a lot to do with how the wind set up. So the fact that you're putting a lot of those on the eastern side of the Rockies helps to initiate uh, shower storms and possibly storms. Then you have the Gulf of Mexico, which you can look at this map, jets westward quite a bit into our continent. Imagine if you just filled in between Florida, Cuba, and what's not shown on the map, there's the Yucatan Peninsula, just the Gulf of Mexico needed land. Our annual precipitation would probably drop to something less, probably half or a little bit more than half of what we get right now, which is about 45 inches of rain a year. That Gulf of Mexico is shallow and warm, it's not true by any cool air or cool water currents at all. Heats up very nicely. Of course, hurricanes use that to their advantage. Uh, but it is so close to the other air masses that it doesn't take but a few hours to get that injected right back up into the trouble zone. So you have moist air basically coming up from the Gulf. The Gulf, the geographic feature, if it was not there, we would not see the same amount of tornadoes and severe thunderstorms. Hands down, just no way. One question we always ask is, if it, is it modified Gulf air or is it pure? Did it, was it born over the Gulf or was it, or did it move over someplace else first? We'll talk about that in a second. 
Here are the dew points. I highlighted the 60 degree dew point line in January is in South Florida. In January, in July, it's all the way up to Fargo, just about. So there's a huge reversal of the amount of moisture available over the central United States during the summer. The Gulf just opens up. It floods the entire central United States with abundant amounts of moisture, which, as you know, is an energy form and also a contributor to unstable air. Here's a cold outbreak where you have air that flows out, the CP air is coming off that high. Interesting, look how you are outlining the um, the Florida coast and the Carolina coast, because it takes X number of miles for that cold, dry air to move over to warm water, pick up moisture, and all of a sudden clouds form. And you can see the outline of the United States. And I have a blue and then a white and a green arrow saying that you know eventually that flows over the Gulf, turns back over Texas, picks up moisture from the Gulf, and goes back over Texas. But this is not purely Gulf air. It started out so dry that it didn't have time to pick up a lot of moisture. It's, it's okay. Your worst outbreaks, though, are pure Gulf of Mexico driven, where those air masses start there and they are all about the water. Then we have the Colorado Plateau. It's not just the fact that it's mountainous out there, it's the fact that a large chunk of that part of the world is thousands and thousands of feet above each sea level with mountains on top of that. It's high, it's elevated, and it's dry. Uh, it's dry because the moisture of the Pacific Ocean can't make it there because the mountain barriers in Sierra Nevada and others rob all the moisture on the windward side and leave nothing when it comes to where Arizona and New Mexico and Colorado. So it's a dry place and a hot place. And all the things we talked about earlier, with insulation, sun increase, mixing, all that makes that air very unstable, but unusable for severe weather because there's absolutely no moisture in it. But it's sitting there nevertheless. When it moves, it does two things. It creates a thing called the dry line, which is a United States specialty. There really isn't any place on the planet that produces dry lines quite like we do. And then we have this air that can go off a lot over, which you'll see in a minute, the moist air, and can make a huge difference in what kind of severe weather we get. So the dry line is a major contributor to thunderstorm initiation. I, I've never seen a statistic yet, but I would guess that about half of the thunderstorms that produce tornadoes are generated by the dry line. That's huge. Again, if it didn't exist, we wouldn't see the number of tornadoes that we do. It's the leading edge of that CT area as it advances from the southwestern United States, or it actually backs up to sometimes. It can be thought of up front with the same ability to create circulations and cause air to surface converge, force air up, all these triggers that we uh, mentioned. Fronts like cold fronts represent density differences between cold and warm. Does a dry line do that? And the question is, what's heavier, dry air or moist air? Just without thinking about it, what would you say? Heavier, dry or moist? Moist. moist. Thank you. <laughs> well, what's, the intuitive answer seems to be moist, right? Because you know the water is certainly heavy. You go the water, it's not easy to carry. Actually, dry air is slightly more dense. And all you got to do is do the calculations here. And there's no test here, so don't worry about it. But if you add up diatomic oxygen and nitrogen together and add it and then multiply by their percentage of uh, occurrence in our atmosphere, you get 29. But the molecular weight of H2O is only 18. So if you replace those atom for atom, you're taking out 29 and replacing it with 18. Uh, so you're basically looking at moist air with water vapor and being lighter. So a dry line is like a front. It moves like snow plow, which forces air up by Elevated mixed layer, that's the layer of dry air aloft. If you remember, out over the Colorado Plateau, this is thousands of feet up. If it moves horizontally in the Great Plains to do this, where is this going to end up? Up here somewhere. And uh, it produces something called a loaded gun sounding. There's a kind of cross section. So you have this huge layer up high where the air has been mixed over the plateau, sun wind being down, mixing it up, making it as much as unstable as it possibly and the winds blow it out horizontally over the plains. The plains drop off, that's the green, at the elevation. The gulf supplies this moist, warm air. And what you've just done here is the same as if you turn the burner on high at home with water or pot, put a lid on it, and then wash it. It starts to boil, it starts to happen to that lid after a while, starts shaking a little bit. You are putting warm, moist air underneath, essentially a lid. And if it ever pops, you're in trouble. It pops a lot, obviously. 
That's the loaded gun sounding. The, the black line is how temperature changes with height. The green is how the moisture changes with height. So moisture is trapped where the dew point and temperature are right next to each other there at the beginning, and all of a sudden, form. It just kind of goes like that. That's that dry air a lot. And again, the United States is unique in the sense that it can produce this uh, EML a lot. And it can actually transport it sometimes as far northeast as New York State, Pennsylvania, and the Carolinas. It's most prevalent here in, in Oklahoma, but it can be transported a great long distance. And there's really no place in the United States that, or in the world that duplicates this quite as, as, as well as we do. So there's all the players right there. And that's how we can plot out so many different tornadoes in the United States. We just bring together a unique set of air masses and circumstances. A lot of it is geographically induced. So geographically and meteorologically, the United States, especially the Great Plains, is a great place to chase storms. It's flat. It's unpopulated for the most part. It has a gridded road system, which makes it easy to navigate around. Um, no roundabouts out in the middle of Kansas. It's just like this, everywhere you go, pretty much. There's improved wireless communications now, which make it possible to get out there and get data to your phone. There are still some dead zones, believe me. Um, but it's getting better. Storm chasers from all over the world come here, and not surprisingly, to chase. They'll schedule their vacations and their airline tickets for weeks in May based on statistics. Some of them have wild success, others sit under a ridge of high pressure the entire week and get nothing after spending thousands of dollars on their vacation. So if you think storm chasing chase, or storm chasing maze, then you can. There are storm chasing tour companies. They're everywhere. Everybody and his brother can start one of these. That's because it's easy to do now with technology, but there's lots of competition. The gas prices are a lot higher than they were several years ago. It's making it tough. Media outlets with teams of chasers. We have a chase vehicle. Other stations who think we're bad. Up in Oklahoma, they got helicopters and they got trucks and they got vehicles and they got satellite and they got all this stuff. All these guys are out when the storms come. Um, the Discovery Channel, you know about the Storm Chaser episode. You guys watch that? Who, who watches that? Um, the Green Terror. Okay. You know he has single-handedly made you know uh, storm chasing. Uh, recreational sport, basically, um, and it's got a lot of people excited about it. Then uh, all chasers refer to local people as yahoos, that's the official name of someone who has little or no experience and grabs their smartphone and decides to go chase a local storm, and uh, it really just crowds the road. Look at that picture right there. How far the chasers go back over the second hill. Uh, there's a thunderstorm back there producing a tornado, by the way. Um, and I can only imagine what would happen if one of these days this backs up and somebody gets in the wrong spot and the tornado, either a new storm develops and these people can't get out of the way in time, it's going to be trouble. Um, that's a notorious picture, a famous picture right there of the uh, tornado intercept vehicle, TIV. Um, Sean Casey drives that, that armored tank, passing on the hill. Boy, you get a lot of trouble for that. If you watch Storm Chasers, you know what happened to him. Yes, never did that. The guy who's funding is said, you have to stay 100 miles away from us from now on. So if we're chasing a storm here, you, you have to be over there until we leave because of this incident. So, um, you know, they claim, and the thing of it is, he says, well, I've got other vehicles out ahead that tell me the coast is clear to do that. Well, that makes absolutely no sense because then you're putting responsibility in someone else's hands. What if uh, an old farmer boy turns left onto the right side of that road there? Then what are you going to do? Oops, there's somebody there now. Everybody passing, so it's not a good thing. Chaser convergence, it's actually frustrating. Many chasers, especially at universities, who are actually trying to go out there and, and do some research. You can't move around, can't get your vehicles in a position. We have done storm chasing here at the university. Uh, we've done two of them, 2009 2011. Both times we had three vans, meaning it's nine passenger vans, 12 passenger vans. Usually it's seven or seven students per van, so we've had over 20 students each. First year we went over 3,000 miles in eight states, and we had to pull back the range a little bit because of gas prices and said, well, you can do it again, you got to settle down. Um, it, it's not offered every year just to the way the course is structured, but a good chance it might be offered again in 2013 if you're around. I had a student who kept his GPS tracking down the first year, so that's what we did. That's where we went. We actually saw the tornado way in the upper left hand corner in all places, Wyoming, which is not what I would have picked to see a tornado, but eight states, 3,200 miles plus. 
Um, there's something about the state of Oklahoma. They use this special kind of gravel mixed with something, and it's I call it snot on linoleum. Uh, it's not mud because your wheel wells really don't sink into it, but uh, your tires just spin and spin and spin like they're on ice, and it doesn't take but a little bit of rain to activate this. So fortunately, when your hands get stuck like this, you have 20 students to push you out, including yours truly in the white shirt there. Uh, you can get all three of your hands out, but we got uh, enthusiastic, and even though I saw a YouTube video of this happening on the chaser, we still peaked the hill and did this anyway, which is amazing to me, but uh, fortunately we were in no danger, the storms were pretty you know, weak and pathetic, uh, and they were north of us anyway, you can kind of see that's looking west there. So here's another attempt to get them in, the hill's not that steep, there he goes, there he goes, there he goes. Like to 
get that right. Look at that double structure right there. See the weather channel was right underneath them when it was doing that. And they saw these two ropes kind of verified like this one looking right up into the sun. It's kind of old. But we just settled for this. It's roping out. Look at that. Look at that rope. Look at that rope. I was reminding the students at this point to make sure right, that you get your cameras out, to have a friend take a picture with the tornado in the background, and maybe in the foreground, so you can say, hey, look at the tornado. And you always forget that, you know, you're so focused on taking the tornado that you uh, uh, might forget about that kind of documentation of, hey, I was here. So this tornado is in its dissipating stage, obviously.
had this one on a Friday afternoon. It's one of the it's, it's their main, their main north-south drive.